evening, everyone. Welcome to Takeo After Dark. Tonight's topic, commercial HVAC hydronic chilled water system, the components of that. Uh, my name is Brett Zerba, and I am an applications engineer, training engineer with Takeo. I've been with the company 25 years. Today, Today's main presenter will be Rich Medeiros. So I'll be the moderator. Rich uh, will introduce himself shortly. I, I recognize quite a few of the names on here. So I think you've been through it before. Before we get started, if a couple of you could raise your hand so we know that you can hear me. We were having some technical difficulties. Okay, thank you, Braden, David, Dean, and others. So it does sound like, uh, uh, it seems like people can hear me and see uh, Rich's screen. So this is the After Dark series. Uh, we're, the formal presentation will be seven to a little after eight. But we'll be on and uh, until we fall asleep, uh, and that, well, hopefully that'll be well after eight, but you never know with us, uh, at least for me anyways, uh, it's, it's getting close to my bedtime, uh, but um, welcome, we appreciate your time, ask questions, I'll be monitoring the questions, there are no handouts today, but um, we are um, recording this session, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we are recording this session, and um, as most of you know, you'll get a, a video, uh, excuse me, an email tomorrow with access to the recording, and to your uh, PDH certificate if you'd like one. Uh, so feel free to print that out. And if you ever have any uh, problems in that regard, uh, let us know. So uh, hard to believe it's already December, what, December 2nd already? Uh, so uh, for, for anyone that's keeping track and that needs to know, uh, Christmas is three weeks from uh, uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday. So uh, at least uh, I, I think we get Friday, we get at least Friday off. Maybe I'll take Monday off too, I think so. I'm going to take Monday off, have a nice four-day weekend. And so uh, Takeo Thermal Appliance Company uh, started in uh, 1920. Uh, 1920, is that right? Not 1820, right? That's a little too long ago. 1920. Uh, 1920 uh, by, uh, by Johnny's dad, uh, gr grandfather. So it's a third-generation privately held company headquartered in Cranston, Rhode Island. I was in Cranston yesterday. I was in Cranston yesterday. I had a nice visit to the uh, to the office. I live about 82 miles uh, fr from the office, so uh, most of the time I'm working remotely nowadays. Um, you, you know, we're, we're, we're a U.S. manufacturing company headquartered in, in Cranston. We have a facility also in Fall River, Mass., which is about 20, 25 minutes away. Uh, New England's pretty close to together, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, uh, so uh, it's not like uh, some of you folks that might li live in Texas, right, and it takes you uh, five hours to get to another uh, county, uh, but nonetheless, so uh, it's pretty close back here, but we also have a facility in uh, Milton, Canada, and throughout the other parts of the United States and throughout the world, uh, Czechoslovakia, we have a facility in, in, in Italy, uh, so we have a foundry in Vietnam, we are really, really a, a, a national a worldwide company nowadays so specializing in hvac hydronic uh, components mostly pumps mostly pumps but uh, we we do a lot of uh, expansion tanks and storage tanks uh, our fall river facility and their welding team is uh, second to none in my opinion second to none and some of you i recognize some names on here have been to that facility and uh, you, you know what i mean uh, my friend arthur brown's on here so if he's listening he knows what i'm talking about and uh, Deb Paiva, I hope Deb's listening. Hi, Deb. Uh, Deb works for Takeo, so she's sitting in tonight. Uh, uh, I haven't gotten to see her in so long, I almost forgot to, for, for, forgot about that. Hi, Deb. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I hope your son's doing well. <clears throat> he was quite a quite a Little League baseball player and a college baseball player for, for, for uh, a lot of his career uh, before he moved on to, uh, or he got older. So he, <laughs> anyways, I digress. Uh, but like I said, let's let's have some fun tonight. Ask some questions, uh, you know, even off-topic questions. I, I think last week uh, someone pointed out uh, Rich had a screen up there and it was, it was Invader or something, and someone made a comment about it. So uh, that, that's really what, what what this is all about. We do want to teach you, want, want you to learn, uh, and Rich does a great job of that. <clears throat> he is second to none in our industry uh, for knowledge uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so uh, he he has designed uh, more than one system, uh, to, to, to say the least, and, and many of us have, have had the uh, pr privilege of being in his design, especially at, at, at the Takeo facility. He, he was uh, instrumental in our uh, IDC center uh, in, in the HVAC design of that, and uh, uh, if, if, it, it, he did a heck of a job, him his team. 
he did such a good job. We we hired him away from his uh, from the from the place and had him come to work for us. Other people did that, not me, that's for sure. But I'm glad they did. You know what, Rich? I, I've yapped enough. I've had some fun, uh, goofed around a little bit. But uh, why don't you finish uh, introducing yourself and take it away, my friend? Sounds great, Brett. Thanks for the uh, kind introduction. Again, my name's Rich Medeiros. I'm a mechanical engineer here at Taco. Um, uh, I specialize in the engineering design of HVAC systems. I am a PE registered in a couple of different states, and uh, I've been at it for a couple of years. I've been with Taco. Um, I just celebrated my ninth year anniversary a couple of weeks ago, in November. So um, I'm I'm currently uh, in my tenth year. So hopefully, if all goes well, I'll get, be able to stay around another uh, 20 years. So. <laughs> Sounds good. So as uh, as the name implies, take a after dark. Uh, it's uh, a chance for you to kick back, kick off your uh, bunny slippers, and uh, maybe grab a couple of beers or cocktail, and and let's have a little fun tonight. So tonight's topic is all about uh, components. Let's see if I get my screen to work here. Hydronic cooling system components. So this is really uh, an introduction of the kinds of pieces and parts that you would find in a hydronic cooling system, sometimes referred to as a chilled water system. And we'll go into uh, some items in some detail, others we'll just touch base on. The ones that we are familiar with or that we manufacture, we'll go into a little bit more detail. The ones that, we, uh, that you find in a hydronic cooling system, uh, we do not manufacture, but we'll we'll talk a little bit about and ask questions. Ask questions. Uh, you can type them in, and Brett will ask me to pause periodically, and we'll go through your questions. Any questions out there yet, Brett? No, nope. nope uh, clear so far, my friend. Okay, so uh, let's get into it. So I always like to put up uh, this uh, this little kind of catchphrase here, review and comply with all local and national codes before starting cooling plant design. Um, we had a situation not too long ago, I guess it was a couple, it's about a couple of years ago now because of COVID, where someone actually took a picture, a screenshot of one of our diagrams and tried to uh, uh, go ahead and, and build the system. But our diagrams, if you see any here, are really just for training purposes. They're not intended to be complete diagrams and cross all the T's and dot the I's. It's it's really for training. We try to strip out a lot of information that might add to the appropriate code or safety or that sort of thing uh, because we just want to talk about the basic concepts. So that's why we throw this in there. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk a little bit about the building cooling load so we get a sense of uh, how big this equipment uh, might be for an average size building. We're going to talk about hydronic cooling system diagram. We have one we'll, we'll show you and we'll break it down into its major components. We'll talk about components that are inside the mechanical room and then we'll talk about components that are outside the mechanical room. And then today, the discussion is going to be not only outside the mechanical room, some of the components will be outside the mechanical room and inside the building, and other components will be outside the mechanical room and outside the building, out in the weather. So we'll hopefully we'll differentiate what we mean by all of that. And then questions. And as Brett said, and I like to re reinforce, is that uh, ask your questions in real time. You don't have to wait till the end. Uh, type them in. Brett will ask me to pause periodically, and uh, we'll answer your questions as we go along. That's what makes this uh, fun in the evening. It's kind of kick back a little, ask some questions. If you want to crack a couple of jokes, we'd love to hear them. Um, all that kind of fun stuff. So what do we mean by building cooling load? Well, we're just taking a, a building. I like the, this building. It happens to be in Massachusetts. It's the TripAdvisor headquarters. But I, I just like the photograph. The, the, the data I'm going to show you is not specific to this building. I just pretend that the building is a certain size. And, and so I want to get a sense of how big our components are going to be that we're going to talk about this evening. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how we can determine what our component sizes should be. So we'll take a typical office building. We'll pretend that the building is 400,000 square feet, 400,000 square feet. 
which is probably an average size office building these days. And if we say that that building, 400,000 square feet, the cooling load is estimated at approximately 400 square foot per ton, which is kind of an average number that uh, people have been kicking around for a long time. And, and if you take 400,000 square feet and you divide it by 400 square foot per ton, then you're going to get a thousand tons. And if you notice, I put a little asterisk after the thousand tons here. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. What it means is that the actual cooling load should be based on a detailed cooling load calculation. So whenever we're trying to get an order of magnitude something, we could use 400 square foot per ton. It gives us a ballpark number of uh, how big the equipment should be, and, and then we can use that for conceptualizing and things like that. But when it gets into the actual selection of equipment, you, you should do a detailed cooling load calculation. And, and we, also, we actually offer uh, the TACO load tool, and I'm going to uh, put the link here. Uh, you can either use a you can take a photograph of the screen I have up there, you can do a screen saver, or you can wait for the video to come out tomorrow. But uh, if you go to our uh, Takeo Comfort Solutions homepage, and you go into software. Actually, why don't I do that, Brett? Well, we can do that, right? Yeah. A couple of seconds here. So I'm just gonna click on uh, Chrome here, and we'll click on Takeo Comfort Solutions. There's our home page. Right in the middle at the top, there's a little drop down menu. It says software. And then I can go all the way down here to the load tool. I'll click on that. And then you'll see that the load tool is on the right. And it's based on the ASHRAE method. And you can just click on download. And you'll download it, put it on your desktop. And you can use it for doing. Uh, heating and cooling load calculation. So that's what we mean when we say it's available on our website. Very simple and straightforward, easy to find. It's, there's no cost, you download it for free, and you can use it for uh, detailed heating and cooling load calculations. Okay. So, so, so Rich, while you're um, you know, uh, transitioning back and forth, uh, Jim, uh, put a statement up here, and I think it's in reference to your 400 uh, square foot per ton number. Sure. Um, sure. Not not applicable to data centers or high internal loads. Which that's, is... that's a good point. Yeah, that's why I always right. try to put it, uh, when I do it over here, I always try to put it in context that this is a, uh, let's see, how do we want to, how did I label that? Typical office building, typical office building. Yeah, it's not intended for data centers. It's not the right number for data centers. It's not the right number for hospitals or laboratories. Uh, any type of facility, industrial, it really is a typical office building. So and that's what we're kind of focusing our attention on today. So that's a good point. I'm glad they brought that up. Yep, appreciate that. Yeah, cool stuff. Okay, so we, we're going to, you know, use our imagination here a little bit and focus in on what some of the components might look like as part of, as part of a thousand ton system, a thousand ton system. Okay, so we have a chilled water diagram. I'm going to grab my pen. Now I can grab my pen over here and I can kind of circle some things. So we talked about components that are inside the mechanical room. So I'm going to kind of make a little circle. And I actually have a slide where I'm going to kind of focus or, or yeah, go into this in a little bit more detail. Kind of draw a line right up to here. There we go. So all of this stuff is inside the mechanical room. And I'll show you a, a little bit easier to read diagram. We'll, we'll dig into that. And then this equipment is, these are open cell cooling towers because we're using water cooled chillers in this case. And I'll go over that in a few minutes. And those are outside the building exposed to the weather. So that's the stuff that's outside the building. And then this stuff is outside the mechanical room, but inside the building, outside the mechanical room, but inside the building. So that's the three major kind of categories of equipment is inside the mechanical room, outside in the weather, and then inside the building. Three, and so you can kind of organize your components in those three categories. Isn't that cool? I like it. 
I like, I like it. it. I like drawing bubbles. It's fun. <laughs> You're good at it too. I'm good. Yeah. You're a good bubble drawer. A good bubble guy. How about a good, a good bubble blower? Or maybe when you were younger, you were maybe. Bubble. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about that the other day. Have you ever seen any of those guys that take the, uh, they make the bubbles almost like a out of a hula hoop, and they yeah. make these gigantic bubbles. And they get them to float around and stuff. That's yeah. amazing. I know it's crazy. When you think about it. Cool stuff. Okay, so let's uh, kind of zoom in a little bit. Again, I'm re redrawing this or kind of grouping it together. What's inside the mechanical room? And inside the mechanical room, we have and I have a list of components, but let's just go through. We have some pumps over here on the right. Those are condenser water pumps. We have these guys in the middle. These are water cooled chillers. And then we have the primary chilled water pumps. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Primary chilled water pumps over here. We have a hydraulic separator that separates the primary from the secondary. So let me just put a little P here for primary and secondary. So over here, this is, uh, this is right in this general area over here. This is sometimes referred to as the primary pumping system there it is right there primary and then this guy over here which includes the stuff that's inside the building which we'll, we'll see that in a minute all of this wonderful stuff over here is the secondary side of the pumping system and then over here on the right as we already mentioned a moment ago this is the condenser water system because we have cooling i'm sorry we have chillers that are two chillers at 50% capacity. You can see they're 500 tons each. And so this is the condenser water system. So I just kind of abbreviate that, C-O-N-D. And we have all these different components to talk about. It's really cool stuff. Okay. So all of this stuff in this little box are inside the mechanical room. This is what you typically find inside of a mechanical room for a hydronic cooling system, also known as a chilled water system. And again, let's just emphasize a couple of things. We're sending water out to the cooling towers in this direction here, it goes out to the cooling towers, and those are going out at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And the cooling tower is responsible for rejecting all of the heat from the building. Can I make an F over here? Yes, I can. Look at that, Brett. Yep. You got That's it, baby. Nice. And then it comes back from the cooling tower. It comes back from the cooling tower at 85 degrees. So the cooling tower is responsible for rejecting the heat, not only the heat in the building, but also the heat generated by the uh, chillers themselves. So all of that's going out there. And then the chilled water is leaving the chiller on the chilled water side. And I'll, I'll kind of point to the pipe one here and one at the top there. And I'll redraw I'll draw this bigger number so you can easily see it. That's 42 degrees Fahrenheit. And it returns in our case, you can see it down here, but I will put it in there bigger numbers. 54 degrees Fahrenheit. 54. So does anybody want to tell me what the difference in temperature is between the supply chilled water and the return chilled water? Anybody can do that high level mathematics they want to type that in let's see if we challenge some folks out there see if they're still awake after uh being late at night well some some folks are late at night others are uh earlier in the day or maybe even uh very very early well we've had a couple of uh, uh type ins uh 12 a lot of 12s uh 123 i'm not sure where the 23 came in but i think I think he corrected himself. So, uh, so the delta 12. T on the chilled water <laughs> side is equal to 12 degrees Fahrenheit. And whenever you have a system that your chilled water temperature is 12 degrees Fahrenheit, it translates into two, you ready for this, Brett? Two, two. gallons per minute, two GPM, yay, two GPM per, okay. Drum roll, please. Per ton. There you go. Two GPM per ton. So in a thousand ton system, we should be pumping approximately 2000 GPM. And if you look over here, I know you can't see the numbers probably because they're tiny, but it says 997.2. 
And that's because the software calculates it based on the mass rate of flow and then converts it into gallons per minute based on the temperature. So a thousand uh, there and a thousand here approximately, that's 2,000 gallons per minute. So that's how you can quickly estimate how much flow you're going to need for a chilled water system that uses a 12 degree delta T. And by the way, just for the fun of it, if you're using a 10 degree delta T, the lower the delta T, the higher the GPM per ton is. And so that would be 2.4 GPM per ton, 2.4. So a 10 degrees delta T Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit, that would be uh, 2.4 GPM per ton. So I'm not going to put all the labels in there. And Any by the way, and by a couple of comments, and I, I like some of these right here. I like them all, all the time. Uh, one gentleman said, and it's 12.2 degrees Celsius. <laughs> it's 12, is it 12.2 degrees Celsius? Well, that's what he wrote. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. So there. <laughs> oh, oh, that, oh, that's because, oh, yes, because, uh, that's right. It would be, uh, let's see, it would be five ninths of that, right? Right. Yeah. So let's see. So 12 times five divided by nine comes, oh, wait a minute. Uh, it, plus 30, I don't know. Whatever. I guess, I guess I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Well, maybe they they can tell us how they convert that. But Any okay. So yeah, we, have, uh, we, we do. Um, well, here's another comment. Uh, uh, it, is it true or what, what's your statement about uh, this statement here? The cooler you run the towers, the more efficient the chillers will operate. 95 is upper limit. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. But yet generally you're, you're uh, restricted by nature. Nature meaning the weather. Right. So if you happen to be in New England, and I know a lot of folks are not in New England, but we'll just use New England as our starting point here. We, the cooling towers are operate as a function of wet bulb temperature. So here we have wet bulb. And in New England, the typical wet bulb that we use for sizing cooling towers is 78 degrees Fahrenheit. 78, our wet bulb temperature. And that's because of in the summertime, that's the usually uh, a pretty good temperature to use for wet bulb. Okay, so if our wet bulb temperature is 78, and our return water temperature is 85, then if we take uh, 85 minus 78, 85 degrees minus 78 degrees, that's called the approach temperature, and in our case, that would be seven degrees Fahrenheit. Seven degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so here's where the fun starts. You can get a, lo you can get a lower approach temperature. You can't change the wet bulb, that's a weather condition. I mean, that's part of the physics of the universe. Well, at least the universe as we know it on the on Earth. Uh, so you, you can't manipulate the weather, but you can change the approach temperature. But if you shrink the approach temperature so that you have cooler water going back to your chillers, you have to have a larger, physically larger cooling tower. You have to have more surface area and you have to evaporate um, more water in order to get the temperature lower in order to get the approach closest. So the closer you get to 78 degrees, the bigger the cooling tower has to be. So in the uh, heat rejection business, uh, seven degrees is a reasonable temperature for reasonable sized cooling towers without paying a penalty on the size of the tower at one end and then without paying a gigantic penalty on the chilled water side or the condenser water side of the chiller. Paul is the same thing. Any other questions? Um, yeah, this is an appropriate question. Uh, that ju two GPM per ton. How did you get that formula for the two GPM per ton, or what is the formula? What is the formula? All right, we got some good stuff here. Yes, we do. We do. We do. Uh, let's see. Can can I hold off? Can you kind of? Uh, well, yep. no. Let's let's do it now. We might as well, right? So when we talk about uh, uh, GPM, there's GPM right there. We have a formula. In, uh, in hydronics, the GPM is equal to the BTUs per hour, BTUs, hey, look at that, Brett, BTUs, BTUs, whoa, per hour divided by, okay, HR, there it is, not, not human resources, but hour, <laughs> divided by a constant of 500, and divided by the delta T, which in our case we said was 12. 
12 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, how many BTUs are there in a ton? Anybody want to guess at that one? How many BTUs per hour is equal to one ton of cooling? Well, while they're trying to figure that out, I'll just write I it out. I see a lot there. of 12,000s popping yeah, up. Yeah, a lot of 12,000s. So there you go. So you take 12,000 and you divide that by 500. Uh, and you divide that, like we just said, divided by 12. So the simple arithmetic, because we always like doing simple arithmetic. If you take 12 and you go into 12,000, that's 1,000. Cross out the zeros here. That's 1,000. And then 1,000 divided by 500 is equal to 2. So that's 2 gallons per minute per ton. How do you like that? Bingo, bango, bongo. Yeah. And then uh, Q equals 500. GPM delta T or you know something like that. Two GPM per ton. Yep. And then uh, um, uh, Jim made a statement: 81 degrees design wet bulb in some of our locations. We get some large towers. I guess you would. Holy moly. Yeah, that, that's that's hot and humid. That's yeah. 81 degrees. That's miserable. <laughs> 78 is miserable. Wet bulb. Uh -huh. uh, 81 is even more miserable. And then uh, cooling towers wouldn't be in operation at seven degrees, eh? Eh? Must be. A... <laughs> I'm not Anyways. sure I understand that question. Yeah, I said outside temperature. I guess he was must be referring to. Not sure. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Yeah. I don't know what he's referring to. Maybe he could uh, type in and be tell us something else. Okay, so yep. I'm gonna move on to the next one. Any other questions? I need to. No. Nope. Okay. So let's keep going. So there's our inside mechanical room, and, and then we have the equipment that's outside the mechanical room, outside the building, which we already talked about. In our case tonight, we're going to talk about uh, open cell cooling towers. These are devices that are going to reject heat to the atmosphere. There's those temperatures again, 95 and 85. And then we have the uh, outside, the equipment that's outside the mechanical room, but inside the building. Those are typically the terminal devices. And we're going to go over each one of these categories in more detail. Okay, so components that are inside the mechanical room, well, uh, that would include pumps and chillers, expansion tanks, hydraulic separators, buffer tanks, air and dirt separators, multi-purpose valves. There's a bunch of other stuff in mechanical rooms like isolation valves and drain valves and, and uh, all kinds of fun stuff. But we're tonight interested in the major components of a hydronic cooling system. So let's go through each one of these. Pumps is the first one on the list. I like pumps. Remind me later, whatever that nonsense was. So here are the two most common pumps in our industry today. The guy on the left is an end suction pump. And it's base mounted. Uh, from Taco, you can get end suction pumps either base mounted or close coupled. Close coupled. There's a mouthful for you. But I've only shown uh, the base mounted end suction pump. And for those of you that are thinking about pumps, perhaps for the first time, one of the interesting things about end suction pumps is that the water enters the pump at the end of the suction and then leaves vertically upward. And there is a 90 degree angle between the supply, between the suction side of the pump and the discharge side. And the suction side of the pump is generally speaking on an end suction pump is one size larger than the discharge. So if the inlet on this pump happens to be four inches on the suction, perhaps the discharge is three inches up here. So those are the kind of characteristics. And then we have the electric motor, which is mounted independently from the uh, pump itself. And then underneath this guard here, there's a flexible coupling that allows the motor shaft, kind of draw a little shaft here, and the pump shaft to be connected by a flexible coupling between the two. The other category is called vertical inline. And as the name implies, the, it's in line with the piping system. This is the suction side here. So there's the pipe that comes in the suction. There's discharge. And one of the major uh, characteristics of an inline pump is that the suction and the discharge are the same size. So if 
this suction happens to be four inches, the discharge would also be four inches. And that's characteristic of all inline pumps. As the name implies, it's in line with the piping system. You can almost think of it this way. You can take a pipe and, and then you can, if you cut the pipe here and here, then you can mount the pump between those sections of pipe. Can I get a little eraser? I don't know. Can I get an eraser? Uh, all I can do is erase all, the whole thing. All, all or nothing, I think. All or nothing. Yeah, that's no fun. Anyway, uh, so if this is our pipe, we can connect the pump uh, in line with the piping by simply cutting the pipe. That's not how you do it in the real world, but in, you can sort of think of inserting the pipe if you cut the section out. So therefore, it's in line, in line with the piping. So those are the two most popular pumps. And for tonight's discussion, I just wanted to also include um, the other uh, pumps, especially for larger chilled water systems, we have our horizontal split case category of pumps, and these can go up to as high as 15,000 gallons per minute. And then we have our vertical split case. So where do those names come from? Well, let's get my pen again. Uh, the horizontal split case is divided along this horizontal plane. You can barely see the division right there and there. That part top part comes off in that direction. The piping uh, does not have to be disconnected from the pump in order to service the, uh, if you take the top part of the pump the casing off, you can access the bearings, you can access the impeller, the shaft, all kinds of fun stuff. And a vertical split case, as the name implies, you can barely see it. You can certainly see it in the back. There's that seam right there. And that seam is along a vertical line kind of like that. And so that's where the name comes from. And on the uh, vertical split case, which is also true of the horizontal split case, the suction side, this is the suction side here on this pump, and there's the discharge in the background. The suction is always one pipe size larger than the discharge. And that's also true of most of the um, horizontal split case. So those four pumps are the most popular pumps that are used in our industry today. Actually, the previous slide, let me go back here. Uh, the previous slide is really the most popular pumps are the uh, base mounted end suction and the vertical inlines, but for big systems that you have to have lots of gallons per minute for both the chilled water and the condenser water, you start getting into the horizontal split case and the vertical split case. Okay, Brett, before we go on, any questions? Yep. Uh, why does the base mounted pump have a size difference from suction to discharge? Ah, because in order to make the uh, pump more efficient, um, when, the, when the guys from our engineering group design the impellers and the volute, they are actually uh, increasing the velocity as it exits the pump by going from a larger diameter to a smaller diameter. And that um, velocity is ultimately converted into static pressure, which gives us the ability to move the fluid through the piping system. So it has to do the, with the relationship of the uh, rotating impeller and the velocity of the fluid as it makes the conversion from uh, velocity pressure into static pressure. I can answer the next question, but I'm going to ask it. Uh, and can, uh, can you get an insulation package? I'm assuming he's uh, uh, Gordon's referring to our pumps, uh, and uh, the answer is no. Um, you cannot. Uh, Taco does not supply insulation packages for their um, bigger pumps, anyways. And some Good of the point. smaller ones we do. Um, some of the smaller and some of the ECM pumps, maybe more, uh, less than a couple of horsepower, uh, we offer that, but not for the bigger pumps. Not for the big commercial. Correct. Okay, so that was the first category of equipment. And then we have chillers. So today we're gonna to talk about water-cooled chillers. So we, we kind of touch base on them, water-cooled chillers. But I'm not gonna go into the details of refrigeration. That's another topic that takes a couple of hours all on its own. But the responsibility of a chiller is to provide chilled water to your system. And then from our diagram previously, in our case, we're going to be supplying chilled water at 42 degrees Fahrenheit, and the return water temperature is going to be 54 for a 12 degree delta T. 
And as the name implies, water cooled simply means that we are using water to cool the chiller or to reject heat to the condenser water. And that condenser water is ultimately pumped out into the cooling towers to reject heat to the atmosphere. Whoa. And if someone has a question about water cooled chillers, I can answer some quick questions, but we're not going to go into a lot of detail on chillers, just to mention they're part of the one of the components in a hydronic cooling system. You're, you're clear, my friend. Okay, so we are going to talk about one quick thing. Tons of cooling is, I like to say it's heavy stuff. So where did the term ton of cooling come from? Well, it turns out that if we take a block of ice, block of ice, and we add heat to that to melt the ice. So there we go, we're gonna melt the ice. It, the heat needed to melt one pound of ice happens to be, coincidentally, this is a cool number when you think about it, 144 BTUs per pound. That's how many uh, BTUs of heat you have to add to a pound of ice in order to melt it or change it from a solid to a liquid. Well, the ton of cooling actually comes from the following. It's the amount of heat needed to melt 2,000 pounds of ice uh, in 24 hours. And 2,000 pounds, another name for 2,000 pounds is a ton of ice. So if we add uh, heat to a block of ice that weighs a ton and we add that heat uh, in over a 24-hour period to melt all of that ice, it comes out to one ton of cooling is equal to 2,000 pounds times 144 BTU per pound divided by 24 hours. comes back to that same magic number that we had before which is 12,000 BTUs per hour. And again, HR is hour, not human resources. <laughs> oh, anyway. Don't call them personnel. Oh my Don't God. Call them no. Oh boy. You, or you'll, you'll be written up by HR. Yeah, there you go. Okay, uh, any questions? Nope, you're in good shape. All right, so what's another major piece of uh, component in the is that is an expansion tank, an expansion tank. And in this case, we're talking about a bladder style expansion tank. I'm not going to go in tonight's discussion all the different styles of expansion tanks, but I will say, I'll make a little simple diagram here. No. Whoops, that didn't look so good, Brett. That, that looked like a little weird. Okay, we'll try it again. So if we have an expansion tank, and here's the metal container similar to the one on the left. And then there is a connection at the top of this tank where you can connect the pipe. And on the inside of that connection is the bladder. The bladder is where the water goes. Then over here on the steel container is a Schrader valve, Schrader valve. That's the same valve that you find in your tire. So this is the air side of the tank, put an A in there. The bladder is connected to the water side of the tank, and that's where it gets its name, bladder style expansion tank. So this is connected to a piping system. We kind of make a little piping system over here. And then we'll say the pipe runs past us in the system. Yeah. And then as the water expands as a function of temperature, it goes into the bladder, and then it's held in place by the air cushion that's around there. So those are the basic components of a bladder style expansion tank. So that's a major component. And uh, expansion tanks are responsible for a couple of different things. A lot of folks think they're just responsible to accept the expanding fluid as the fluid increases in temperature. But it's also responsible in concert with the fill valve to maintain the minimum pressure in the system. And properly sized, it also is designed to maintain the maximum pressure in the system. So the, the uh, expansion tank uh, does uh, four functions. The fourth function is if I look at a diagram. Oh, can I go back? Yeah, I can go back, right, Brett? Yep. Let me do that. Let's go back here to our system diagram. Hello, system diagram. Where are There you go. There's our complete system diagram, and the expansion tank is right here on this little diagram right there. And it's connected to the suction side of the pumps. There's the connection to the suction side of the pumps. And where it's connected right there is called the point of no pressure change. The 
point of no pressure change. So the expansion tank is responsible not only for maintaining, let me just go get back to where we left off, maintaining the minimum pressure in concert with the fill valve, the maximum pressure, the expanding fluid, and also the point of no pressure change. So when you put the expansion tank, you connect it to the suction side of the pump, it maintains a constant pressure on the suction side of the pump, which is really important uh, in order to maintain the proper operation of a pumping system. Isn't that cool? Yep. Okay. Now we get into hydraulic separators. Hydraulic separators, we have uh, two styles. The one on the right is called a 5900. This guy right here is called a 5900. And this separates the primary circuit from the secondary piping circuit or pumping circuit. And the one on the left is called the 5900 uh, Flex Balance Plus. And the plus means that it has these added Paul rings inside these metal baskets in order to enhance the uh, air removal characteristics of the uh, hydraulic separator. So the one on the right will allow air to escape. The one on the left will allow air to escape, but also will allow collect dirt at the bottom with this blowdown valve and get rid of the dirt. That, so the one on the left is good for both air and dirt. The one on the right is, uh, and, the, and both of these are separating the primary from the secondary piping system. So that's another important component in a system. Ah. Now here's, here's where we have our buffer tank. Um, almost all chiller manufacturers today will tell you how many gallons of water you need in your chilled water system for proper operation of your chiller. And to get the proper amount of water in your system, your buffer tank, the amount of water is dictated by the chiller manufacturer and they will publish the number of gallons per ton that you need for your buffer storage tank. And generally it's in the order of magnitude of somewhere between three to five gallons, three to five gallons per ton of, uh, of capacity. So in our case, uh, we said we had a thousand ton system so if the manufacturer wanted, <laughs> the chiller manufacturer wanted to maintain uh, the proper amount of water volume and how to, ex the way in which we size an expansion tank is we simply take the, the thousand gallons. Let's say that this particular chiller manufacturer wants 5,000 gallons per ton. So we take a thousand tons, there it is right there, thousand tons, that's what we said our system would be. And we multiply that by five gallons per ton, five gallons per ton, there we go, per ton, then our system would need 5,000 gallons. But the tank doesn't have to be 5,000 gallons because some of that volume is also in the piping system. So we subtract out the volume of water in the piping system. And let's assume we're just going to make up a number for tonight's discussion. Let's say that the piping system had a volume of 4,000 gallons. So you'd subtract out the piping system. And lo and behold, your expansion tank would, I'm not expansion, but buffer tank would be 1,000 gallons. So it's as simple as that. So you, as you can see, you have to go back to the chiller manufacturer and they tell you what the gallons per ton needs to be. Uh, and the general industry average is around five, but some manufacturers want slightly more, some others want a little bit less. So there you go. And and our uh, uh, buffer tank is a happy tank. It's a happy fellow. <laughs> so we have a great question here. What is the difference between a buffer and an expansion tank? Ah, excellent question. So in a buffer tank, it stores water, almost like storing uh, uh, power in a battery. It actually stores water or creates a place for water to collect 
when it's uh, entering and leaving the uh, buffer tank. But in an expansion tank, the water does not flow in and out, although we do have some designs where the water does flow in and out, but that's another discussion for another day. Um, and so the, uh, the buffer tank is always 100% full of water, 100%, as opposed to an expansion tank. Typically, an expansion tank is usually filled somewhere between 30 to 50% of the tank is filled with water. So buffer tanks are 100% full, and they create like a, a sort of like a battery or storage. And an expansion tank does not... Um, uh, store water, it uh, allows it to expand into the bladder, and usually it's a fraction of the total volume of the tank itself. Did I make that as clear as mud, Brett? No, excellent job. And uh, uh, another great comment here, and I think this is an appropriate one to bring up right now, is uh, the HSS software that uh, Rich will touch base on, and uh, uh, we'll do the volume calc and tank selection for you if you want to plug your, uh, if you, it's a really good program. So anyways. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. And then uh, uh, someone's asking, can you offer uh, custom paint jobs as an option? And I'm sure we can. Our our boys in Fall River will uh, uh, paint it pink if you'd like. Uh, but uh, no, there can be some custom paints. I'm just kidding around. Uh, but yes, there is custom paint, paint colors available. I wonder if I could get an orange tank. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool, right? You have enough I'd money, you can get any color you want. Not, well, you know, even you can get them painted, um, but we also manufacture stainless steel tanks, and I've seen some of the giant ones they've manufactured in Fall River, and those look really cool because they're right, they're shiny, so they're, they're really stainless steel looks really really cool and, and uh, I, I would like to comment that rich showed a picture of a, a buffer tank with uh, two port connections uh, but someone's asking can you get one with uh, four connections four port connections and the answer is yes so we have different options available uh, for those you can get in more information from your takeo rep or go to our website on that wouldn't you say that rich probably yeah, yeah. you can get them in all kinds of great configurations so yeah it's uh and we can and we'll custom make them also. And they and they can come and you can get them insulated. There's uh, five or six common insulations uh, types that they offer for that as well. And uh, someone's making a statement: buffer tanks soften temperature swings to prevent chiller control difficulties as well. I like that phrase. I do. To to well, read that again, Brett. Buffer to, tanks. Uh, buffer tanks. Buffer tank softens temperature swings. To prevent chiller control difficulties. Yeah, that's a great phrase. We we should uh, copy that. We'll, we'll we'll plagiarize it and uh, and add that's it. A great, yeah. That's a great little phrase. I like. Yeah, that. Jim, Jim's been very helpful with our uh, presentation. He's been uh, adding a lot. He did some calcs for us too that I'll bring up near the end as well. Go ahead. Good. Okay, so uh, we also have in our system we have air and dirt separators, and here is our famous 4900 series air and dirt separator. And this one has a removable top. Uh, you can get them with a removable top. And what's really cool about this guy is that the piping system, again, let's, let's draw our piping system. Let's assume that the pipe flow is going from left to right. There's the inlet and there's the outlet. And other than the fact that you have to have isolation valves somewhere in the system, um, you, can't, you don't have to disconnect it from the piping system. You just unbolt the bolts for this top flange from the top flange from the bottom flange, bolts and nuts. Remove the top. You can take the basket out. You can uh, uh, pressure wash the uh, pull rings that are inside the basket, bolt it all back together with a new gasket, and the thing is like brand new all over again. So, yeah, the air comes out the top, and... Dirt gets collected, drops in the bottom, and goes out the blowdown valve at the bottom there. Good stuff. We got all and kinds of fun stuff this evening. So, someone just made a comment, uh, and it's true. Uh, many of these components uh, that you talked about uh, during last uh, week or month's uh, presentation on the hot water systems. <laughs> yes, they're common to both the hot water and the chilled water. And as Brett pointed out, when it comes to certain components, you may want to have them insulated because they will sweat 
if they're not properly insulated, especially if you have a mechanical room in the summertime that's ventilated with outside air, it's not air conditioned, and the uh, the dew point temperature uh, is probably close to like 55 degrees or even higher in the extreme weather, and the chilled water is circulating at around 42 to 54, which is well below the dew point temperature, so it will definitely sweat. And that's why insulation is so important for these different kinds of uh, components. So yeah, hot water, we insulate hot water uh, components to uh, reduce the amount of heat rejection into the space. And we insulate chilled water components uh, to keep them from sweating and also to keep the unwanted heat from transferring you know, through the equipment or piping system uh, into the uh, water, reducing the chilled water effective capacity. But yeah, many of the components are the same. And uh, I want to send a shout out to somebody, uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, I've known him for many years, uh, and I think uh, you had the privilege of meeting him as well. Uh, Jeff Vestal from uh, down in the Carolinas is watching this with uh, three generations of people, himself uh, and must be one of his uh, children and his grandchildren are watching our, your presentation, Rich. So wow. feel privileged. Feel I'm privileged. like a multi-generational uh, <laughs> instructor. Yeah, That's great, Brett. Yep. Okay, what else have we got here? Oh, wait a minute, we gotta click on the thing here to get it to change. Multi-purpose valves, these are great. So they, they perform four functions. They act as balancing valves, metering valves, check valves, and isolation valves. And what's really cool about the ones that we offer, multi-purpose valve, this little valve here on the left is identical to the one that's on the right in order to this one on the left is a 90 degree angle. So it makes a, a left or right turn, depending on how you want to look at it. And then you undo these four bolts and on these flanges, and you can rotate it 180 degrees and turn it into a vertical, straight through multi purpose valve. So it does four functions, and it also has the ability to act as both a 90 degree fitting and a straight through fitting. Isn't that cool, Brett? Yep. I think that's really cool. Field changeable, too. Field changeable, yeah. You can do that in the field. Just don't ruin the gasket. It'll need to put a new gasket on. And uh, just to confirm, that is a manual balancing valve, not an automatic. Yes, a manual balancing valve. Absolutely. Okay. Keeping going through the some of our other components here. So what are the components that are outside the mechanical room? Well, the major components for a hydronic cooling system would be the cooling towers. They're outside the mechanical room. In most applications, not all, not all locations, but in most applications, the pumps generally are inside the mechanical room for the condenser water pumps feeding the cooling tower. And, uh, uh, but there are some cases there, uh, I've seen them especially in Florida, they'll have the the condenser water pumps outside uh, outside in the weather, actually. So here's a picture of a cooling tower, and here's some, uh, some sort of interesting facts about cooling towers. So cooling towers, they evap it's called evaporative cooling tower. They ev evaporate water um, to cool the, the condenser water. And Cooling towers reject approximately 1,040 BTUs for every pound of water at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. There goes that phrase, Brett. I, I can see myself. Uh, uh, I have to make the translation. You've probably heard me say this tonight. Water. Half a dozen times already. Water. That's my New England accent kicking in. Water, water. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, uh, so um, we talked about wet bulb temperature before, so we're just gonna touch base on it. The entering water temperature is 95 degrees. That's usually what the, leaves the condenser side of the chiller, the water-cooled chiller. It enters the cooling tower at 95 degrees. It leaves the cooling tower at 85. The difference between the wet bulb and the leaving water temperature is called the approach temperature, 85 minus 78, and again, most cooling tower manufacturers, their nominal capacity is based on a seven degree approach. If you want a shorter approach, say a five degree approach, 
you can certainly uh, order that from your uh, cooling tower uh, rep, which it would be a Taco rep. Most of our Taco reps uh, have a cooling tower line. And uh, if you want a closer approach temperature to make the chill a little bit more efficient, you're going to have to buy physically larger tower and perhaps even a, a higher airflow, so a little more horsepower. So the nominal capacity of cooling towers today is approximately three gallons per minute per ton, because again, it's not only taking the uh, heat re rejected by the building, but also the inefficiency of the chiller's compressor. And that's why you wind up with three GPM per ton. Remember we said if you had a 10 degree delta T, that would be 2.4 GPM per ton. Well, in this case, we do have a 10 degree delta T, but 2.4 would not be enough to offset the heat rejection by the chiller itself or the inefficiency of the chiller. So that's why you have to have more flow for those two things. And the evaporation, the water is approximately somewhere between three to 5% of the flow, and that includes the uh, evaporation, drift, and blowdown. So what do I mean by, uh, let's go through those three terms. Evaporation, that's the amount of moisture that the cooling tower is evaporating in order to cool the condenser water. So the water enters the cooling tower on the side, goes through all of these little openings, which is called fill, and then it exits at the top. I better erase that other thing there. So, so the air enters the sides of the cooling tower, in this case, probably both sides on the other side also. And then inside the tower, the water flows, I'm sorry, the air flows up, and then the fan, which is in this top section right here, blows the air up and evaporates the water. And so that's what we call evaporation. Drift is what happens when the wind blows. When the wind blows, it actually strips water off of the cooling tower and it doesn't get to evaporate uh, and cool the fluid. It just gets wasted by the air that's out there. And cooling tower manufacturers try to design their towers to minimize the amount of water that's lost through drift. And blow down, when you evaporate water in a cooling tower, what's left behind is sometimes not all that good looking. And uh, it can be really disastrous looking stuff. And it, it actually collects in the basin of the cooling tower, it can actually turn into mud if it's very severe. And so what you do periodically is you open a valve, there's a valve at the bottom of the tower, and typically that goes to a drain. Uh, a drain somewhere, and usually it has to go to a sanitary system and not a storm drains because there's chemicals in there. And then, so you, you can open the valve manually. Most people use automatic valves. They open up based on the um, conductivity of the fluid. The more the fluid conducts electricity, the dirtier the fluid is, and so they open the valve electrically and then blow it down. So you have to add enough water to compensate for the blowdown, the drift, and the evaporation. And generally speaking, that's three to 5% of the condenser water flow. So in our case, um, if you had a cooling tower uh, and you had three GPM per ton, that's 3,000 GPM. If I multiply that by 0 0.03, that's 3%. I would need uh, 90 gallons per minute of makeup water to the tower in order to uh, compensate for evaporation, drift, and blowdown. Cool stuff, isn't it? All right, so w Rich, you and I are going to learn something, and maybe everyone else will too, or not everybody, but some people. This is from Sarah. <clears throat> I think you mean water. That's how you say water in <laughs> Philadelphia. W-O-O-D-E-R, water. Water? <laughs> oh. I so the water, the water and the wooders. Yeah, there you go. Um, anyways, and then uh, uh, Gordon is saying, uh, yes, you got it, Sarah says. Uh, uh, one thing to be careful about uh, with condenser pumps is are subject to cavitation. So that's another whole conversation. That's a, yeah, that's so another true. series so of true. discussions called uh, net positive suction head and cavitation, which we don't have a lot of time this evening to go through. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the the terminal, I mean, the stuff that's outside the mechanical room, but inside the building, and that includes uh, equipment such as terminal units, air handling units, control valves, balancing valves, isolation valves, strainers. Let's look and see what this stuff looks like. So for terminal units, we can have uh, 
we can have fan coils and you, you can get the type that fit above the ceiling and they don't have any cabinets over them. Uh, they're probably the least expensive, but they do have a cooling coil up here. If it's a four pipe unit, it might have a separate heating coil. This one perhaps just has a cooling coil, has a drain pan because as the moisture drips off this coil and the pipe is collected in the drain pan, and then you have a condensate pipe that goes to a condensate drain somewhere. You can also get them with cabinets on them, fan coils with cabinets. This one is uh, usually mounted uh, below a ceiling. Um, and then we also have uh, floor mounted units. And each one uh, will do the same basic function, uh, different configurations. Eh. How are we doing for time? We're actually, uh, wow. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock, eight o'clock. We're not doing too bad. Uh, I wanted to put this in here. It, it, typically, you would have a hydronic radiant floor heating system, but in some cases, you can actually use chilled water uh, as long as in a radiant floor system. You can actually take the hot water radiant system and you can circulate cold water through it as long as the water temperature is above the dew point temperature. And you actually see these types of systems in uh, buildings, especially uh, buildings that are located in places like Arizona. And I know that Walmart um, uses that uh, uh, radiant cooling system. I know I have heating here, but I, I wanted to show you a radiant heating. All you need to do is circulate chilled water above the dew point temperature, you get radiant cooling, which is kind of interesting. So that's another terminal unit that you can use in your system. You can also use uh, hydronic active chill beams. Chill beams, in this case, it's a four pipe, which is both hot water and chilled water, or you can get them as two pipe, in which case they would be just chilled water, and you'd have to have a changeover system if you wanted to circulate hot water through them. So that's another terminal device. Here is another terminal device a lot of people are not familiar with. This is called a fan-powered sensible cooling VAV box, variable air volume box. And this coil right here that mounts on the side, airflow comes from the primary air duct. So here's the primary air duct. We kind of pretend there's a duct over here connected to this side. And that comes typically from your dedicated outside air unit, which is called a DOAS. And then there's a fan inside here. You can't see it, but I'll kind of draw it, kind of imagine the fan is lying on its side. And so it has the primary air, it mixes with the ceiling air and gets cooled by the uh, sensible cooling coil. And those two air quantities mix and it comes out the end of the VAV box. So you can find terminal units, fan powered, and this uh, coil, by the way, does sensible cooling because the water is circulated above the dew point temperature. And that's another way of using a terminal unit in a in a hydronic cooling system. Cool stuff. We're almost at the end. Hang in there. You would send chilled water to an air handling unit, and they can be either roof mounted or they can be inside mechanical rooms, but basically we're sending chilled water. The chilled water flows through a coil, and in this case, the air is entering this unit from, let's get my pen, from the left passing through the filter sections and then uh, into the cooling coil and then the fan blows the air out. It could blow the air up. The fan could be oriented to blow the air uh, horizontally or vertically down. It all depends on the orientation of the fan and how the air handling unit is designed. So that's another device. We're almost there. Control valves. You can use uh, manuf uh, Taco manufacturers, the zone sentry valve, which can be used for hydronic cooling systems. And we also have a multi-volt zone control valve. These are typically used on fan coils for relatively small flows and stuff. For larger flows, you would use a, a, a third party. This one happens to be manufactured by Belimo, and they make them from... I think ours go up to, what do we make ours up to, Brett? Is it one inch or three quarters? Maybe someone out there in the uh, Takeo world could tell me. 
What did you say you thought it was? I thought it was one, but it could be three quarters. You're right. Yeah. So if it goes up to one, then then you'd have to go to another manufacturer like Belimo, and they make them uh, from one inch on up to as big as you want them. Modulating control valves. And then balancing valves. We have the Taco AccuFlow, which is really cool uh, because if you'll notice, you have right over here, we have the high pressure, connect this to a pressure differential gauge. Then there's the high pressure tap. This is the low pressure tap. And these are Schrader valves. And the flow, the arrow indicates the flow in this direction here. You can see the arrow on the side. Water comes in, water goes out. You connect it to a gauge. Connect this guy to the gauge and the other guy to the to a gauge. Let's say there's a gauge right here. And then that will tell us the pressure differential across the valve. And then we have a chart. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the chart will show us the relationship between the different size valves, the flow. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice here. It's getting late. The flow and the pressure drop, the delta P here, for each size. And then you can just crank in what you want for pressure differential. It'll tell you what the flow is if you know what the chart and the size is. And then you can get accurate flow for balancing. Isn't that cool? I like that. And then one inch, one inch, one inch. Uh, we also have isolation valves. Now, Taco doesn't manufacture isolation valves, but uh, there's a variety of companies that provide them. And probably for two inch and less, the typically isolation valve is uh, usually for HVAC systems is a ball valve. And then for anything over two inch is probably going to be a butterfly valve. So those are the two most common types of isolation valves you find in a uh, system. And then the last guy is the strainer. A strainer is used to uh, remove particles as it passes through the piping system onto usually a coil. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we don't want the coil to plug up with debris. The water would flow in this direction here, exit over here, and then there's a little strainer inside here. You can't actually see it, but it flows around, then out. And then it has a hose bib cap right there, and then a blowdown valve so that you can blow down the debris as it collects over time. So those are all, those are the major, major components that you find in a hydronic cooling system. So we've covered a lot of uh, different products and stuff. So now is when we get to uh, try to answer as many questions as possible. Type them in, baby. Type them in. We, we uh, it's a little slow right now. Um, uh, I guess. Did uh, everyone did... already go home? No, no, we still have quite a few on. Uh, it's what, 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 W A W T U H in the southeast. Just in case <laughs> you were wondering. I, I, nobody pronounces it water, in other words, I guess. Uh, well, you know, in New England, we, we we drop our G's, so we don't say fishing. We say fishing. 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 That's true. And, and driving. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you and know, so, uh, I, I, I guess uh, I, I guess it's important to realize that there's a, there's a lot of similarities between a heating system and a cooling system. But from a design standpoint, there's probably a lot of differences, too. You know, you got to take so much so many different things into account, I would think, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, one of the major considerations for a hydronic cooling system is that it has to be properly insulated so that the piping, the components, the valves, the pumps, all those things don't sweat all over the place. Uh, there was a problem in a building that I had to look at about four years ago, and uh, it was a fan coil system inside the building, and it was a brand new building, and when they started up the building, the uh, insulation on the piping system was not the best job in the universe, and the building had piping inside the walls that was dripping all over the place. And they had mold issues, and they had uh, all kinds of problems, just simply because the insulation was so poorly done. So, yeah. So Jim what's your uh, has its special special problems? What's your comment on shutoff valves? You can't have enough of them. <laughs> I can't have enough of them. I, I I mean, if you if you have a system that's got ten shutoff valves, I want it to have twenty. 
So yeah, the more isolation that you can do, the better you're going to be in terms of service and maintenance. And so some people say, well, I don't want to put a lot of isolation valves because it creates pressure drop. Well, if, you know, most of the smaller piping, if you go with uh, full port ball valves, it, the pressure drop is negligible. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's a late night scene. I, I mean, uh, you, you know, uh, there's nothing more frustrating than when you have to repair, fix, change something, what a get gain access and the nearest shutoff valve is uh, two miles away. Obviously I'm being, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh yeah. Here's a great question. Why is the chiller ineff inefficiency that needs to be rejected? But wait, I may be reading this wrong. Well, I'm gonna read it like it says and then maybe we can correct it, Robert. Why is the chiller inefficiency that needs to be rejected by the cooling tower so high? Seems like a huge inefficiency going from 2.4 GPM to ton to 3, 3 GPM per ton. Well, actually, that make... that's an excellent, excellent question. The actual heat uh, that is uh, rejected as a function of the inefficiency of the chiller is probably going to translate into less than 3 GPM per ton. And you have to get that information from the chiller manufacturer. The reason we use 3 GPM per ton is because it covers a variety of sins. Uh, when water-cooled chillers were first used on commercial systems, uh, they were quite inefficient, not as efficient as the newer chillers are today. And because of their inefficiency, the 3 GPM per ton became a nominal flow rate for sizing uh, uh, condenser water systems, including cooling towers. But if you actually work with a chiller manufacturer for a specific set of conditions, you may find that it doesn't require 3 GPM per ton. It, it, can't, it can't run less than 2.4 GPM per ton or else the heat rejection or the inefficiency of the chiller wouldn't exist. And you can't have that. You can't have a chiller that's 100% efficient. So it's going to be somewhere between, uh, well, it's obviously going to be greater than 2.4, so it's probably going to be somewhere between 2.6 and 3 GPM per ton. And again, you get that information from the chiller manufacturer based on a specific set of operating characteristics. All right, so we got some good questions here. <clears throat> What's your opinion on commercial slash industrial water treatment for a hydronic cooling system? Oh, that, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> that, that question I'm going to sidestep. If we have one of our reps out there that uh, reps uh, chemical treatment for chilled water, condenser water systems, I'm going to leave that uh, for them to answer. So contact your local rep and find out what the latest and greatest technology is for chemical treatment. Um, I am not an expert in uh, chemical water treatment. You know, I think that's a a, a great point. Um, find find experts, and you know what I mean. I, I learned that at a young age, right? I'm 62 years old. I've been doing stupid things for, for a long time. I've design work for a long time. Now I'm training, whatever. But many times I I would search, seek out an expert, right? Seek because, out, yeah. And and let them um, help you as much as you know, because. Water is, as Jim is saying, the quality is different uh, from the, your street to the person down the other street or the other side of town or let alone cities. Right, Rich? I mean, you can't. It's unbelievable. Yeah, there's somewhat there's such a variation in the quality of water, water, water. What, hey, water, Brett, you, water. you were just saying you're you're 62. So in two more years, will I be able to sing that song to you? Yes. 64 you still bottles need, of beer. On will you still feed me when I'm 64? Bum, 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 Actually, bum, it's only oh. a year and a half or less. Okay, yeah. so where, where where you run piping in the building, where the insulation envelope occurs, and control of the building dew point is critical in chilled water systems design in human areas. Even a decent insulation job can give trouble in a poorly conditioned design building. So true, right? I, I mean, Absolutely, I don't think. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, in a condition space, you know, all things uh, being equal, let's say, well, let's take our headquarters building. Our dew point temperature is maintained at about 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the summertime. And so um, 
if we allowed the dew point temperature ri to rise, it, the building not only would be uncomfortable, but we run the risk of uh, uh, components sweating where they wouldn't sweat if the uh, dew point temperature uh, was kept under control. So yeah, that's an important piece. Um, so uh, someone's asking, so some of you, this equipment that you're showing is located outside. When do you start considering um, uh, glycol or, or some other inhibitor in, in the in the water uh, to prevent freezing? You well, that's an yeah, that's an interesting uh, concept. So, uh, so the, when you when you think of a cooling tower and you think of condenser water, uh, there's, there's two there's two functions of a cooling tower in the winter time. So, cooling towers, and let's just talk about specifically open cell cooling towers for a moment. Now, open cell cooling towers, by their very nature, are exposed to the atmosphere, even in freezing conditions. And so, many cooling towers operate in uh, severe cold weather in the wintertime to provide free cooling, usually through a plate and frame heat exchanger. So, there's no glycol added to the system, but to keep the piping from freezing and to keep the base of the cooling tower from freezing, they use basin heaters in the basin of the cooling tower, and then we typically, for piping that's exposed to the weather, it's heat traced and insulated. And that is uh, has been kind of the uh, standard approach for condenser water systems that have cooling towers sitting out in the weather. So the, here's our cooling towers. So there would be uh, basin heaters. They're usually, uh, so the, the international, Energy Conservation Code, or IECC, International, yeah, IECC, um, does not recommend using basin heaters uh, for their cooling towers because they're wasting electricity. But typically, the basin heaters are in the electric heaters, resistance heaters that are in the base of the cooling tower, and then the piping itself is uh, heat traced, which means that we, right along the the in the outside surface of the pipe, we put uh, resistance heaters, and then we cover those resistance heaters with insulation. And that's how we keep the piping from freezing. Now, if you move, move to a closed, closed loop cooling tower, in the winter time, the cooling tower becomes a dry cooler. It's no longer evaporating water. You shut off the water evaporation, and now you can use um, uh, you can use glycol in a closed loop cooling tower and, and if i kind of generate put a uh, heat exchanger over here and let's say i put a pump uh, this is not the best diagram in the world but you get the general idea here if i put a pump over here and i pump to a plate and frame heat exchanger then i can have glycol on the, if it's a closed loop cooling tower closed and then i can have uh, so i can have glycol over here G for glycol, and on the other side of the heat exchanger, I can have just straight water. And typically, the plate and frames, this would be a representative of a plate and frame. The plate, plate and frame is physically inside the building, inside the building. Um, so then I can have glycol outside if it's a closed loop cooling tower. Remember, if you can't have glycol in an open loop cooling tower because you can't evaporate glycol for cooling purposes. Well, even if you could, you wouldn't because it would cost a fortune to evaporate glycol. And then on the inside of the building, it's all water over here. So that minimizes the amount of glycol that's used. So hopefully that gives some some yep. some guidance. Not many not many designs do I see when I look at people's uh, prints and review them are are, uh, are people running the glycol around the whole building. Usually they separate it with a plate and frame or some type of uh, uh, heat exchanger or something. Um, right. That, in Cranston, that, in our, our the Innovation and Development Center, IDC building. Is that how you say it? ICD, IDC? IDC. IDC, yeah. Innovation Development Center. Yeah, our cooling towers run in the wintertime and they ice up and we have basin heaters and we have uh, heat trace and insulation on the piping. So, yeah, we run our cooling towers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 right, so days a year. Here's a great question. Uh, as they all are, I, and I, I said I don't know how many times I've said this. So this is your. Uh, he's gonna. We're asking your opinion, Rich. What's your most reliable slash favorite hydronic cooling system? Well, first off, it's got to be hydronics, but that's another whole conversation. Oh, he did say. 
are they asking what's my favorite? Uh, yeah. You mean, what's your what's your most favorite slash reliable hydronic cooling system? I guess it's favorite and reliable in the same sentence, maybe uh, and I, whatever, but nonetheless, yeah. Yeah. So this diagram that I've put together here, th this is uh, the components that I I'm, I most favor for a hydronic cooling system. I I like centrifugal chillers. Now, obviously, in tiny systems, it's probably not practical or cost-effective to use a centrifugal chiller. But I'm talking, you know, we started off this discussion of buildings around 400,000 square feet. So anything between, say, 25,000 square feet and a million square feet, um, chilled water systems are extremely efficient and uh, reliable. And I like to configure things uh, the way I have them shown here. I like the uh, pumps. I like to have three pumps, each one sized for 50% of the design load. I like to have the chillers, uh, two chillers for 50%. If I use uh, pumps, let's go to the next slide here. If I use uh, pumps, whether I'm using condenser water or chilled water, I like to have, um, in my secondary pumping system, I like to have three pumps each size for 50% so that if I should lose one of these pumps, I have 100% capacity. And I always have a standby. So if all three pumps are running, or all three pumps are available, let me use that word, and two are running, the third one would operate a standby. So both my chilled water and condenser water operate that way. The logic behind having only two pumps on the uh, primary side of the chilled water distribution where the chillers are. So for commercial, this is where you have to make your decisions based on uh, you know a whole series of economic analyses. But generally speaking, two chillers sized for 50% capacity are usually the most economical for a commercial office building. That's not true of other types of buildings, but for commercial office building. And the reasoning behind that is that the peak load, that's when the building requires, in our case, 1,000 tons. 1,000 tons was our peak load. That only occurs about 3% of the time. The overwhelming majority of cooling hours really only needs to be in the order of magnitude of between 50 and 60% of the system capacity. So if you lose a, a chiller in a simple office building, um, you're going to find that, for the most part, most people are not going to notice for the majority of hours. Now, obviously, if you get into a peak cooling day, um, you're going to uh, seriously miss that that chiller. But it, you know, in a simple office building, uh, it's usually economical to do it that way. Some people, for simple office buildings, will put in three chillers, like I did the pumps, and make them 50% each but it's a big piece of equipment. It's very expensive. Chillers are relatively reliable, especially centrifugal chillers today. They're built to industrial standards. So um, you, someone's asking about your pumping configuration and, and, and some comments there. Uh, what's your comment about variable primary? You know, this is showing primary secondary, is very common, but um, there are other options out there for pipe pumping systems, I guess. Yeah, I mean, pr variable primary flow is very popular these days. Uh, it's uh, more energy efficient than primary secondary, uh, but it's a bit finicky. It uh, requires that the primary flow have a minimum uh, flow. So in other words, if we specify, if you specify a chiller, in this case, we're specifying two chillers at 500 tons each, um, that chiller may only have a 60% a turndown. So in other words, each chiller requires about uh, 1,000 GPM on the chilled water side and about 1,500 GPM on the condenser water side. Well, if it's a variable primary flow on the chilled water side, if that chiller can only withstand a 60% uh, reduction in, capacity, in, in flow, uh, that's limiting. So in other words, you can only uh, turn down your flow to 60%. So if we had a 2,000 ton, I'm sorry, a 1,000 ton system, we had 2,000 GPM, like we've been talking about, 2 GPM per ton, 60% of that um, for one chiller would be 600 gallons per minute. Well, you may want a system to have a, 
uh, more turndown ratio, but you can't do it with a primary uh, variable primary flow. But you can with a primary secondary because the secondary flow in a primary secondary, you can maintain constant flow through your chillers at 100%, and then you could vary your secondary pumps to uh, almost anything you want to meet the demands of the uh, system. So yeah, that, that, primary uh, variable flow uh, has its benefits in energy, but it does it's not quite as flexible as a primary secondary system. So there yeah, there's those. some comments out here that it's pretty pretty uh, finicky and maybe over over the head of some typical maintenance staffs and uh, uh, you know, maybe the controls from for some folks may, it may be difficult. So be careful. Yeah, there. and the chiller itself has, uh, has to have, uh, you know, a substantial number of uh, electronic control components to make sure that the oil doesn't separate from the refrigerant and that the chiller barrel doesn't freeze up. There's all kinds of things. So it makes the chiller itself more physically expensive. Physically? I don't know if that's a way yeah. of looking. <laughs> I like more that expensive. one. That's good. Yeah. You know what? It's more sophisticated. That's accurate right. at 8:30 at p.m. for me and you. <laughs> <laughs> Any someone other made questions? a con someone made a comment that that in their interior dew points can hit 60 degrees very regularly in many building spaces. Man, 60 degrees! Wow. Oh my God, that's one <laughs> uncomfortable building. I guess. Yeah, that's too bad. So, I, I, we're winding down with questions uh, and some comments. So we're getting a lot of pat on the backs and uh, and whatnot. Uh, great, great job as usual. But uh, you know, one of the things we didn't cover a lot of in this presentation, and it's another whole discussion, is the controls. Now, if you think about it, Rich and I work for an HVAC hydronic pump company, right? Um, so when you when you start talking about the controls of all this equipment, that's another whole level of sophistication wouldn't you say that rich i, I mean it, it, yeah i mean it's, controls is a, it's, it's an a, entire science all on its own i and uh I, i've always sort of uh I, i've had great success in my career writing control sequences but i actually tr uh there's a difference between writing a sequence and actually putting hardware and software to get it to get it to make it work and so controls are a very highly specialized area uh, we know what we want the equipment to do, and we write those sequences, and it's up to the control uh, specialists to come up with hardware, software, valves, whatever you want to call it, to uh, to get it to operate properly. And we can we can certainly help in, in terms of uh, strategies for controls, but the actual physical components have to be done by uh, trained controls specialists. So true. So true, and, and you know it's a, it's a, and just like all the pieces of equipment. I, I mean, uh, chillers chillers nowadays have been so sophisticated. It, 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 they're 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 unto themselves. It's unbelievable what uh, what the chiller manufacturers have done. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I think we're I think we're round, uh, rounding uh, rounding the corners and coming down the home stretch, Rich. So we're coming down the home stretch. Yep. Well, we have you, to Eliza, Eliza. You know who's on? Uh, our good friend Olfat's on again tonight. Uh, Olfat, so, how you doing? And she's you can on, unmute she's, yourself and say hi. If she wants. Uh, is she still on? Let me see if she's uh, I'm scooping back. Oh, no, she's uh, scooted out, uh, so she's already uh, said goodbye. So, anyways, great job, Rich. Say, uh, final words, and then I'll close it out. Yeah, if we have, uh, uh, we could take, uh, I'll tell you what, we'll take one more question. Do you have one more out there somewhere, Brett? Or are we pretty um, much questioned out? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, well, here, well, yeah, pretty much questioned out. Um, well, someone said you can pipe a single standby in the primary also for manual valve connection to either chiller. I think that's um, talking about. Uh, yeah, that's up. if you wanted to uh, uh, create uh, do a header the uh, primary chilled water pumps. So yeah, right. there are two major categories. I've shown it as a dedicated chill water pump, which you could pipe it in such a way that you have, but it makes the pump pumping, yeah, it makes the piping and the pumping uh, for uh, connecting them to uh, multiple chillers, it's a little more complex. It's done every day of the week and we help people figure out how to do that, but it's a little bit more complex. Yeah, you know, and uh, Rich, Rich just said we'll help. Uh, uh, Rich and I are available to help. That's uh, that's one thing we are available to do. We, we like talking with you folks and 
educating people and going through stuff and uh, you know rich's presentations are are second to nuns and uh, i want to think that mine are too when i when i do some of them uh, so uh, please uh, reach out to us whenever you can and, and uh, our takeo reps are fantastic uh, get them involved as well they're, they're probably as knowledgeable as we are rich if not more knowledgeable to be quite honest most of them yeah Anyways. Well, at this point, I'm going to say good night and thanks so much for uh, everyone participating and thanks so much for the great questions that are out there. And uh, if we don't talk to you guys uh, uh, before the holidays, uh, have a, uh, a wonderful holiday. And I'll turn it over to Brett. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Rich, as usual. Uh, great job. Um, uh, appreciate all of the pats on the back that people are sending your way, Rich. Uh, appreciate that. And um, I do want to uh, uh, mention that uh, we have one more of these commercial folk, uh, commercial ones. That's next week. Next Thursday, December, what the heck's 9th, December 9th, again at 7 o'clock. And, and this is Top 10 Troubleshooting Tips for Hydronic HVAC Systems. Oh, boy, troubleshooting tips. That's a, that's a, that's a session I wouldn't want to miss, but I, I may. I may fall asleep, but nonetheless... Thanks at all. And uh, someone's saying uh, uh, it's time for Thursday night football. So they're signing off. Pre appreciate everyone's time. Look for your emails tomorrow for, for your PDH and um, uh, the uh, recording. Other than that, we'll talk you down the road. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Great job, Rich.